Welcome to the Takshashila Institution and the Niskanen Center joint webinar on open society. I'm Kodiak Hill Davis, the Director of Government Affairs at Niskanen, and it's my pleasure to be the moderator for today's discussion. Before we begin, I'd like to provide some background on our respective organizations and our speakers. And as a reminder, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we encourage all attendees to submit questions throughout, and our esteemed panelists will answer them at the end. Luckily, that's not my job. The Takshashila Institution is a center for research and education in public policy. It's physically located in Bangalore, India, but it has been operating around the world since 2010 by the internet. As an independent, nonpartisan research think tank, they're engaged with India's relationship with the world, transforming how India is governed, and exploring the intersection of technology, economics, and politics. The institution's work is rooted in the values of freedom, openness, tolerance, pluralism, and responsible citizenship. Similarly, the Niskanen Center is a public policy think tank based in Washington, DC. Founded in 2015 with a mission to develop market-based solutions to public policy challenges and to promote the values of an open society. While our policy work is nonpartisan, it is often described as centrist. The esteemed panelists for today's discussion are Jeffrey Kabaservice of Niskanen and Naran Ramachandran of Takshashila. Jeff is our Director of Political Studies where his work focuses on moderation, centrism, and politics. He is an author and often featured in the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the Guardian. Narayan is the co-founder and fellow of the institution where he teaches a graduate level course on contemporary economics. He is the co-chairman of Unitas Capital, India's largest social enterprise investment bank, and he authors a fortnightly column titled A Visible Hand for the Mint newspaper. So today's discussion will begin with Jeff and Narayan, each providing a few minutes of commentary before they'll shift into more of a dialogue format and then we'll take questions at the end. So without further ado, I turn it over to Jeff. Thanks very much Kodiak for that introduction and uh, I'm glad to be here with Narayan. Talking about um, today's topic, which is open societies. How does the need for tolerance impact government action? And thanks to all of you uh, who are on the screen uh, for being here with us as well. Um, that's a pretty wide open topic and we could take that in a number of directions. Um, but we're hoping that this conversation can build upon our two previous webinars between Takshashila and the Scannon, um, which have sought to address how moderates can respond not just to the ongoing threats to liberal democracy around the world, um, but also to the pandemic that's affecting all nations today, but has a particularly tragic impact on both India and the United States. Um, today, we also want to address the civil rights crisis that has erupted in America during this pandemic, um, and the broader question of how diverse and democratic societies, such as our two societies, can hold together. Um, those of us on the center right are not in the habit of quoting Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, um, but I can't help but think of his uh, alleged quote that there are decades when nothing happens and then there are weeks when decades happen. Um, it really does feel like we've been living through a lot of those weeks. Um, History has been unfolding around us at an accelerated pace and we really have a responsibility to grapple with it. Now, um, this obviously will take us into terrain where we'll be dealing with a lot of controversial cultural questions. And so I want to make clear at the outset that I am not at all, at all, uh, purporting to speak for Niskanen as a whole. Um, the Niskanen Center is a relatively young organization. Um, in fact, it's only been five years since Jerry Taylor created it. Uh, and we do not have a department, in fact, that deals directly with issues of racial equity and social justice. So um, I'm in some danger of embarking what, uh, upon what is in legal terms known as a, a servant on a frolic of his own. Um, but I can say that every member of the center is deeply concerned about the issues of racial equity and social justice. Um, and this issue and this concern uh, permeated our work long before the wave of protests that was sparked by the death of George Floyd at the hands of the Minneapolis police in May. Um, I also say, want, want to say that I'm delighted to be engaging in these questions with uh, Narayan and the Takshashila Institute. Um, against the global tragedies of the pandemic, um, personal disappointments pale into insignificance, uh, but nonetheless, I am 
personally disappointed that I was not able to spend the month of April in Bangalore with the Takshashila Institute as we had originally planned. Uh, I hope that when this is all over, maybe we can do that. Um, and I think Dr. Sheila is an extraordinarily interesting organization. Um, and there are obvious affinities between our two think tanks. Um, both of us are, broadly speaking, fighting for the same kinds of liberal values common to open societies that Kodiak just enumerated. Uh, tolerance, pluralism, freedom, openness, uh, and effective government. Both of us are trying to defend the political center and combat growing illiberalism on both the left and the right. Um, I had the privilege of having an advanced look at Takshashila's forthcoming publication, India's Marathon. Um, and it's, again, a really uh, productive document in terms of thinking about the differences between our society, which are vast, but also the similar situations that we face uh, with regard to global political issues, such as the China threat, um, the pandemics, contribution to the sort of loss of American predominance in the world, um, and these broader questions of how to hold societies together in the face of populism and ideological resurgence on both left and right. Um, it's also interesting to think about this. This is something that I picked up, especially from the document. You know, when we talk about immigration in this country. We very rarely consider it from the perspective of other countries. Um, but in fact, Indians have formed the largest Asian immigrant community in the United States since 2014. Uh, Indian Americans have thrived in the United States and the Indian American community is now the highest educated and highest earning group compared to any other native or immigrant community in the country. Um, and immigration looks different, let's put it that way, when it's viewed from an Indian perspective. Uh, on a personal note, I also want to say that I've been fascinated by India. Wrote my master's thesis on Indians' transition from uh, British colonialism to independence, and particularly the policy of uh, import substitution industrialization, which uh, <clears throat> India held from pretty much independence through the 1980s. Um, I have forgotten a lot of the details of what I learned back then, to be honest. I know that there's a difference between a crore and a lakh, and one of them has to do with millions, and the other one has to do with hundreds of thousands, but I can't remember the details, I'm afraid, at this moment. Uh, but what really did stick with me was um, the absolute independence and the critical importance of the success or failure of India, which is the world's largest democracy, as well as home to one-sixth of humanity, um, and outcomes in India matter immensely to all democratic societies. And uh, although India's caste system is not directly comparable to America's multiracial society, there are some interesting analogies that could be drawn between government treatment of African-Americans in the United States and scheduled castes in India, which is to say the Dalits, formerly known as the untouchables. Um, and like I said, there's also great value in Indian perspective on American issues generally, but on the civil rights movement particularly, uh, because the civil rights movement in America was founded on Gandhian principles of nonviolent resistance, and it still carries on that tradition. Um, as many of you know, Congressman John Lewis died uh, on Friday. Um, he was one of the giants of the civil rights movement. He was the chair of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the youngest person to speak at the March on Washington in 1963, where Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech. Uh, like Dr. King, he was a dedicated student of Gandhi's philosophy. And in fact, I found this that in a forthcoming documentary called Ahimsa, He's quoted as saying that Gandhi's teaching spoke to us. It said, in effect, that when you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, then you have a moral obligation to do something, to say something. And I think that moral obligation speaks to us at Niskanen as well. Um, but this obligation is, let's say, complicated by Niskanen's orientation, which is moderate and nonpartisan, but also to some extent just of where we come from, right-facing. Uh, a number of Niskanen's founders come out of a left libertarian ideology, which is nonetheless usually classified as part of the right. And I come from a moderate Republican orientation, which has a heritage extending back to the Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass tradition, uh, but which is marginalized, to put it mildly, um, in the Republican Party today. Uh, Niskanen is contending not just with Donald Trump's intolerance and outright racism, uh, but also with decades of conservative and Republican indifference or even outright hostility to matters of racial equity. So when we talk about what the Republican Party could do to further an open and discriminatory society, a non-discriminatory society, or even just think about what a center-right could offer as an alternative to 
left-wing conceptions of racial equity. Um, we're essentially trying to envision a political grouping that does not currently exist and may never exist. Um, but I do think that act of imaginative projection is one of the functions of a think tank like ours. Um, I can get into what that would entail, but I think for the time being, I will just end it there and turn the floor over to Narayan. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jeff. Uh, and, and, and you'll see in a moment that uh, I don't have to reach so far across the aisle and reach for Lenin. I might be able to do with a few liberals uh, uh, in my corner. Uh, so thank you very much. And, and I will uh, begin. And I, I thought I might just take a moment. I know uh, many of the uh, people on this conversation already know a little bit about India. But for those who don't, I just thought I'll, I'll, I'll just delve a moment into sort of the background and history so that people are aware. And then we can go on to where we are today. Um, if I may begin by saying India is, is, is just, I mean, unbelievably heterogeneous. I mean, it, the, the, the word heterogeneity could probably be substituted by the word India or vice versa in any sort of in English semantic uh, literature. Uh, it's polyglot, it's religiously multifarious, it's vividly multifaceted. So, I mean, it is, it is everything you, you can imagine and then some. You, you, I used to, in the old days, we used to say it's on steroids, but now we'll have to say it's on fentanyl in terms of its, its diversity. Um, we have 28 states and eight union territories. This after a little somewhat controversial recent reorganization in Kashmir. Uh, the numbers were slightly different before that, but uh, we have lots of states and lots of union territories, which is the same as, as, as federal territories in the US. Uh, we have 22 official languages, and by official languages, I literally mean they have their own layer scripts. There, many of them are their own grammar and so on. Thousands and thousands of dialects. And I know all of you think that we all got married in, in an, with an arranged marriage. It's not true. Some of us actually didn't. Uh, but but uh, there are many arranged marriages. But probably germane to the question here, hundreds of marriage customs. Uh, sort of distant, every 300 kilometers, you run into a new set of marriage customs that you wouldn't see uh, in the previous geographical location. So we have with whales, without whales, with turbans, without turbans, uh, marriage in Kerala in three minutes, and marriage in Tamil Nadu, which is the neighboring state, in five days. So uh, quite a diversity of marriage custom as an example of, of one variation. Another variation is we're vegetarian in the far north in the middle, significantly non-vegetarian in the south, eat fish in the east and south, pork in the west, beef in the south, and so on. So uh, we are equal opportunity offenders when it comes to meat uh, and non-meat. Um, we are majority Hindu, 78%. However, we're not the largest percentage Hindu nation in the world. That credit actually goes to Nepal. Um, we are significantly Muslim, but that's only 15% of our population. Significantly enough that we're sort of tied with Pakistan for the second largest Muslim state in the world. Um, and in addition, we have uh, some religions that some people on this conversation may not even have heard about, such as Zoroastrians, Baha'is. India even has a Jewish community in both Cochin in the south and Mumbai, Mumbai in the north. And we have dozens of tribal and animist religions just dozens. Uh, so quite, quite religiously multifarious, if I, could, if I could say that. India is one of very few countries born to modern independence with a democratic constitution that automatically gave universal adult franchise. Believe it or not, Indian women got the right to vote 25 years before Swiss women. Right, so uh, very different. Uh, sort of in that sense that a somewhat poor country was born constitutionally democratic with universal adult franchise. So in India, tolerance is both civilizational and constitutional. And, you know, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, this is my uh, Lenin, said, uh, though outwardly there was diversity and infinite variety among our people, everywhere there was tremendous impressive oneness, which has held all of us together for ages past, whatever political fate or misfortune has befallen us. And when Nehru spoke about it, much 
misfortune had indeed befallen India, including significant poverty at that time in a population of roughly 350 million people. But like any ancient heterogeneous country, India's divisions and stratifications will absolutely boggle the mind. So if the vividity and the diversity boggle your mind, then the, the divisions will as well. We break on caste, religion, region, class, gender orientation, and you name it, we have it here. And the politics of frequent elections, given these 28 states and eight federal territories and one federal election, uh, we have frequent elections. And often the tool of political election done is to use one or more of these divisions for political gain. And so, like everywhere, the divisions in India are as manifest as the tolerance and constitutional uh, oneness that we are all at least granted in, 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 in theory. In India too, after independence, and independence was in 1947, uh, the liberals came to power uh, after a long battle for freedom. So in a sense, you could say they, they deserve their uh, turn at the wheel, if you would. But, but the, they soon lost contact with the masses, so somewhat what happened pretty much everywhere else. And that created uh, a backlash, uh, somewhat like what have re happened everywhere else, of populism, both from left and right. And in India, it is somewhat like the US, a populism from the right that has come because the liberals, as they became more and more the establishment, ended up being, um, uh, being, uh, so, uh, sorry, I just lost my trend, for, trend of thought for a second there. Let me continue. Uh, the, just going to take a minute. Sorry, somebody here gave me a glass of water that stopped the uh, direction. Uh, so you might think of Indian liberals as having pandered to the minority uh, uh, a lot, uh, and, and that caused the backlash that we now have. And so now we have a government somewhat like in the US, uh, Jeff, that you might say pampers in the, in the US, you might call it Pampers, the, the, the elites here, we might call it Pampers, the majority. Uh, there's some debate to be had whether the majority is the elite or not, but, uh, uh, but in India, we have sort of caught between the rock and the hard place of pandering to the minority and pampering the majority happening, which is where I think your observation about a centrist position that does neither, but navigates a much more balanced path between the two, I think is, is, is germane. And I'll quote James Madison, somebody from your neck of the woods a little bit here, that there are more instances of the abridgment of the freedom of people by gradual and silent encroachments of those in power than by violent and sudden usurpation, right? So uh, that's sort of what's happening pretty much everywhere, but certainly here happening in, in India. But let me conclude with a hopeful direction. Uh, and, and for that, I will, I will lean on Martin Luther King. Uh, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. The famous quote from Martin Luther King, with, which uh, I think Lewis uh, also loved. Uh, now, as a man from the financial profession, I might, if I were to march that to market, say that's a little bit more hopeful than it actually is. But at least as a normative statement, I think we can say, if not that it actually bends towards justice, that it should bend towards justice. So. Uh, there is that hope for all of us. And, I, that, and, and even though the title says, what can government do? I might actually expand that to what can all of us do? I think governments really should create the ambience for in which tolerance is both practiced and nurtured. But alas, we live in a time in the world when not only that is not true, perhaps the opposite is being nurtured and fostered. So we need to lean on other institutions, uh, in both institutions, uh, such as the press, uh, such as civil society, such as think tanks like ours, to sort of keep the scandal and flame alive, even at moments in which governments may be leaning in the opposite direction. And, and, and remembering again Martin Luther King's statement, the arc of the moral universe, long as it is, will uh, sooner or later bend towards this notion of justice, tolerance, pluralism, pluralism and peace. And so I, I, I will leave uh, with a Mahatma Gandhi comment, which says, 
you can hate the sin, but love the sinner. And, and I think that sort of uh, defines uh, between us what a moderate middle path would be. By the way, even the word middle path is actually born in India from one of the great religions that was born in north of India called Buddhism. And so I do think that that's the value for all of us here to take away and for a candle to be lit, even though the, the, the outside environment is in a bit of darkness uh, at, at the moment. Um, so with that, maybe if, if you don't mind, uh, Kodiak, I don't know whether you want to step in here or I can just go ask Jeff the first question. Uh, and I thought we'll get a little bit into it. Uh, is that okay, Kodiak, or would you? Yes, please you do jump? I'm enjoying this conversation already, so I think I can step back and you, you take it over. Okay, and, and, and Jeff, I was struck by your observation that you were in a civil rights crisis. Uh, and, and, and having, uh, I know you're a scholar and student of that time as well, so, so could you just compare and contrast a little bit what, how the 60s look and how today looks? And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm captured by the observation that in your mind, they seem at least similar in intensity. Uh, thanks, Narayan, for your remarks and also for your question. Um, I, I think I would say that in a broad sense, the United States civil rights movement uh, has never ended and should never end because our progress toward equality is at best incomplete. Um, but, and here's where I perhaps draw a line with some uh, uh, leftist colleagues, I do think that there has been progress. Um, and I do think that the 1960s was an era of progress. <clears throat> um, the difference, however, I would say between the 60s and nowadays is number one, the civil rights movement as it existed then was in response to a much harsher regime of Jim Crow segregation. Um, and one of the great achievements of the movement in the 1960s was the achievement of legal equality for African Americans, um, which had been denied uh, through the institution of outright chattel slavery for the first uh, two centuries of our existence as a country, and then for another century in the form of legalized um, de jure segregation. Um, that meant that there was a long history of, of the struggle against legal segregation. Um, there is also the reality that because it was the Republican Party that had fought the Civil War against the Democratic Party dominated South, um, it meant that the Republican Party was still at that point the party of civil rights or at least had a, a claim to that heritage which was very much on the minds of a lot of Republicans. Um, so, you know, a lot of conservatives nowadays like to trumpet the fact that Republicans voted disproportionately in favor of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, and that's true. And that was also because at that point, the most conservative element in American politics were Southern Democrats who had enormous power in Congress. Um, but much of that uh, Southern segregationist element flowed into the Republican Party and was lured to the Republican Party through the GOP's Southern strategy, uh, as well as just changing perceptions. Um, so the Republican Party in many ways abandoned its political rights, uh, political civil rights heritage. And that is a, a critical difference between then and now, because in the 1960s, it was still possible to believe that both parties would compete for the uh, allegiances of all minority voters in the country. Um, and what we have now is a situation where the Republican Party is largely a party of whites. Um, in fact, under Donald Trump, it has become largely a party of non-college educated whites. Um, and our politics is polarizing, not just along political lines, but along racial, ethnic, to some extent, gender lines as well. And this is a very dangerous situation. And although we have not had rioting on the scale of what happened in the 1960s, not anything like that, um, nonetheless, I, in some broad sense, it's a more worrisome time um, than it was in the 1960s. Jeff, would it be fair to say that the racist systems that we were uh, confronting and challenging in the 60s were more overt than what we're facing today, that we're really trying to get at some, some core institutionalized um, systems that are a little bit harder to see. They're not, they're not quite as clear as separate bathrooms or water fountains, but they're just as insidious. Yeah, I think that's a fair statement, Kodiak. Um, the battle of the 1960s was against um, de jure segregation. 
Um, but this also existed alongside de facto segregation, segregation which is not necessarily maintained by the power of the state, but which nonetheless persists. Um, and this is what we're talking about when we refer to um, systematic inequality. Um, and, you know, I have issues, a lot of issues, which we probably will get into between um, what we believe in the moderate center-right political alignment versus a forthcoming kind of successor ideology to liberalism, as it's been called, uh, based on critical race theory. Um, but, you know, you have to actually admit, if you are on this side, that uh, it has valid indictments of the failure of liberalism to achieve racial equity, particularly for African Americans. Um, yes, you know, we as a society have advanced enormously in our racial attitudes. There's no Jim Crow segregation. Um, but consider that in 1968, um, the year in which Martin Luther King was assassinated, um, black households earned only 60% as much as white households and owned assets in terms of wealth that were less than 10% of white families. Well, those statistics are exactly the same today. Um, and it's that persistence of de facto segregation um, that we have to address in the present moment. Yeah, and Kodiak, if I could take a, sort of an Indian uh, stab at that. Uh, I, I do think the nature of the challenge has moved from, from what Jeff has called de jure to de facto. And in that sense, uh, the, the battles and the debates and, and the riots in some instances uh, are much more, much more challenging because you're combating an attitude, uh, a state of mind, uh, a state of being, rather than a law or a, uh, uh, of anything that's, that, that is tangible, uh, which uh, even here in India, we used to combat a lot more in the earlier days. Of course, India is much, uh, much more adolescent in its democracy than, than the US and therefore, we still have to do some work on the de jure side. For instance, uh, in India, only very recently uh, did, uh, did LGBTQ uh, rights uh, even get uh, uh, partially allowed, uh, right? Uh, but, but that said, I would sort of agree that the, the, the battle has moved to the ground of de facto and combating that. That battle is also difficult because uh, there is, of course, this ob obvious uh, view that where you stand depends on where you sit uh, when the observation is insidious, right? So uh, you, can, you can sort of push things back and forth a little bit, depending on whether you are here, there, or in the middle. And so uh, there is no obvious answer to the, the questions that we raise that are more complex in their uh, construct because of now, that said, I think not enough work in either of our countries has been done uh, in terms of uh, separating somewhat simpler issues uh, and dealing with those first. I think that has uh, two or three immediate positives. One positive is a few issues get handled. Uh, second positive is there is a demonstration effect that there can be something that happens. And the third, I think from a societal point of view, which is most required in a system uh, where you're dealing with the facto issues, is that trust between the policed and the policemen, metaphorically speaking, a small p, uh, can improve, right? And, and of course, in the US, it is literal. It is between the society and the policemen. But, 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 but uh, even more broadly, it is, uh, it is uh, the class of policemen and the police and, and, and uh, uh, the famous quote as to, you know, key custodian, the so custodian, right? So who, who, who will police the policeman uh, has come back to haunt us in all senses of that term, um, uh, both at the political sort of policeman as well as where surveillance is just going up and all kinds of human rights violations on privacy are taking place at various levels but also at the community level through actual police uh, uh, in a very, very different way. We don't have the same issues that you have uh, there, but the lack of trust between police and community uh, is uh, manifest here as well. I mean, policemen in India do not carry guns on the street, 
uh, but their arbitrary exercise of power undertakes uh, many forms that are unacceptable to the community. So uh, in, in, in that sense, there is great similarity, even though there are many technical differences between our society. And Ryan, I really appreciated the, the bifurcation between the, the literal police and police as a, as a societal mechanism. I think that that's a fascinating um, distinction. Uh, I'm very insightful. And while I'm disappointed to hear that, um, that India also experiences uh, problematic situations with arbitra arbitrary uh, exercise of power from police, um, it's encouraging to think that both of our societies have room to move forward and that both of our uh, organizations are trying to, to move in the right direction. If I may just add a one quick uh, sort of uh, PS to that, uh, it would be that we in, in, in Takshashila, we do a trust survey every once in a while, which sort of uh, seeks to measure trust between the community and various institutions. Uh, we haven't yet gotten into the institutional element of this discussion, which is obviously very, very important, but uh, for a moment, let's keep that aside. We just do this trust survey. And in this trust survey, unfortunately, uh, it spans a spectrum of institutions, but almost always the police come out rank bottom. Uh, and, and some other institutions such as in India and, and over history, and it might be changing now, but over history, the election commission, for instance, comes at the other end. Uh, and, and the Supreme Court, which is our Supreme Court, which is actually far less partisan than the one in the U, 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 or, or far less uh, politically aligned than, uh, than it is in the US, uh, but is occasionally prone to, to overreach. Uh, and the literality of the constitution doesn't apply quite as much here. So, I mean, we can talk about institutions generally, which is another pillar of this, uh, of this uh, sort of um, fostering of tolerance. Uh, and there, I think we have a lot to learn from how independent and objective certain institutions in the United States can be. Whereas in an emerging market, sometimes they are subject to being captured uh, by the politics of the moment. Could I, uh, could I make an observation here that's, that's relevant, Narayan? Um, Please. I haven't seen the, the latest surveys, but since the 1960s, actually since the 1950s, there's been ongoing surveys that ask Americans more or less the same question about what institutions in our public life do you trust? And if you go back to the early 1960s, there were very high levels of trust in most institutions, uh, government, academia, the administration of justice. Um, and since the 1960s, there are very low levels of trust in all of those institutions. Um, and in fact, the only two institutions, at least up until recently, in which there had been overall majority public trust were the military and the police. Um, however, trust in the right. police is very um, racially divided in that there's a high level of trust in the police among the white majority and a very low level of trust in the police um, in the black community. Um, but you know, the, the, the picture here is also not one of you know, unchanging police practices from the 1960s or indeed through from the founding through the present day. Um, every single one of the riots in the 1960s was triggered by some kind of disproportionate use of police force against the African community. Um, and policymakers were well aware of this in the 1960s. Um, and I spoke with a number of the people who took part in presidential commissions such as the Katzenbach Commission on the Administration of Law Enforcement and Justice, um, as well as the Kerner Commission um, Commission uh, the, on um, civil, disorder, civil Disorder in the United States. Um, and they were always emphatic that what was needed in the United States was a change from policing cars um, to, and in that sense, small p, professionalized police, to com um, community policing, um, a model in which police would actually work to gain the trust of the community, which in turn would actually lead to a higher closure rate for crimes because people would actually talk to the police and tell them what had happened. Um, and there actually was considerable progress in community policing in the United States from the 1960s through uh, really the end of, of the last um, century. And then 9-11 changed a lot of things. 9-11 really uh, contributed toward a militarization of the police, um, which undid a lot of the work of community policing. And it's clear that one of the things that has to happen now is a demilitarization of the police. Um, as well as some means of making the police both more accountable to the communities that they serve 
as well as more integrated with those communities. Yeah, in, the, in that sense, the word I think defunding refers a little bit more to demilitarization. Maybe the mechanism is defunding. But, but uh, I, I, I find that sometimes those two words are used interchangeably and, and, and not quite uh, distinctively enough. I'm not a big fan of defunding as a term because, you know, if that's not what you mean, then you probably shouldn't call it that. Um, on the other hand, it is true that the majority of Americans, when they hear this, don't interpret it as just withdrawing funds for the police or indeed abolishing the police. They do see it as indicative of a need for reform, perhaps a need to shift resources through to uh, more socially oriented kind of social welfare institutions as well. And it's true that the police perhaps have taken on a lot of responsibilities that they would be happy to leave to other entities. I agree, Jeff. I think defund, um, defunding the police as a, as a kind of a rallying cry really incites a strong feeling um, from, from the right uh, of just being um, an untenable idea. But if you were to suggest shifting resources, say, to social workers to provide some of the services that our police forces have been stepping in to, to cover, I think you'd find a lot more traction for an idea like that. But unfortunately, it doesn't fit as tightly onto a sign or bumper sticker as defund the police. And, you know, there would be difficulties with that, too, given that American society is awash in guns, um, which is not the case, for example, in most other societies, such as India. Um, we have particular problems here. Um, I, I also want to, as long as we're on this topic, you know, if you are a white moderate, you cannot address this subject without hearing in the back of your mind the accusation from Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail in 1963, which is that the main obstacle to racial progress is actually the white moderate more than the racist, um, because the white moderate is more dedicated to order than to justice. Um, I think society needs both order and justice. Um, and crime, for example, is the solvent of the liberalism of the 1960s. Um, that's really why liberalism fell as much as any other reason. Um, and one of the great accomplishments of the United States since the 1990s has been the reduction of crime from its all-time peak in 1991 to the present day. This is largely what has contributed to re-urbanization in places like Washington DC where we are today. So there's a question as to how we can retain the gains of that era without succumbing to the kind of indifference that Martin Luther King indicted among many white moderates. Yeah, maybe Kodiak with your permission I can just stretch that as sort of our last sort of discussion between us before we go to the the audience and 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 that is this somewhat widely held notion you know my daughter is just back from college as I told you Jeff and I've been having lots of debates with her and, 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 and for a 19 year old, the, the difference between moderate and insipid is not a meaningful distinction. And, and, and from her point of view, uh, no real change can come from, from being insipid. And, and so uh, she stresses the point that, that in fact, issues have to be painted in spotted owl terms so that we actually end up with a conclusion even if the statement of the issue is obviously extreme in its construct. Um, now, those of us who have lived uh, history and, and who have seen the history of the world and the extremes on the other side where malignancy sometimes coexists with extremism uh, know that that's not necessarily true but it is something that, that is a common objection to taking the middle path, that the middle path is much too trod upon and, and therefore won't lead anywhere. I wonder if you have any thoughts about that before we... Uh... You know, we tend not to like the word centrist around the Niskanen Center because it suggests too much of, what do I stand for? Well, I don't know, what's the left stand for? What's the right stand for? I'll find something in the middle. Um, but, you know, there is a temptation to illiberalism on the left and the right in terms of not uh, being confident that the liberal practices of reformism and open debate can get you where you want to go as a society. Um, but I would argue that just about every uh, advance that we have made as a society has come through open debate, discussion, um, and the sorting out of good ideas from bad. Um, and again, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 kind of being one of the, the critical, uh, most important pieces of legislation passed which was in its way both a radical step because it actually conferred legal equality on a group that had not had it, um, but also was very much a, a moderate movement in that it did rely on this kind of liberal process of negotiation and dialogue. 
and also was conservative in that the civil rights movement was based upon the country's foundational documents and principles of equality for all, um, as well as the old American uh, motto that's still on our dollar bill, a pluribus unum from many one. So I think that the current, uh, the current iteration of the civil rights movement that we are now experiencing will also have to partake in some level of radicalism, uh, moderation, and conservatism if it's to succeed. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, this discussion has been wonderful and we have some very, very good questions. So I wanna make sure that we reserve time to get to those. Uh, we have about 20 minutes left of this conversation and four questions so far, although I have a feeling we may get some more. So I'll start with the first question. Is pluralism and tolerance made difficult by social media? If yes, is there any hope that this could change in the future? Of course, social media is a pretty new construct, only about 10 years. I go first, Jeff? Sure, please. Yeah, so uh, as, as uh, some of you may or may not have caught it when Kodiak uh, did the introduction, but uh, among many things, uh, Takshashila uh, is, is born young. Uh, most of our <laughs> researchers and scholars are, are well under 30 and, and somewhat like the, our country itself, the median age is 25. Uh, so uh, even though I don't belong to that generation, I can at least uh, uh, borrow from them liberally. Uh, social media as a, po I mean, the, the history of, of discussion, debate, enlightenment, and thought has always been impacted and influenced by the medium of discussion. So this is not new ever since Athenian democracy or uh, the Buddhist, uh, uh, you know, debates of uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, or the advent of the Bible and the subsequent uh, age of enlightenment and debates then. Uh, a medium of communication, a channel uh, of debate as the Federalist Papers and the famous debates in the US and so on has always been an important element of, uh, of both setting the debate and evolving and influencing the debate. But social media is, I think, fundamentally different because it is uh, a little bit like, uh, to mix some metaphors from physics, it's a little bit like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. The presence of social media actually changes the debate. Uh, and so sometimes in predictable ways, but sometimes in very random and unpredictable ways. And I don't think uh, the scholarship or serious study has really delved into this sufficiently to comprehend uh, the full impact uh, because of this nature of intertwining of social media in the debate. It's, it's no longer a, a channel. It is a participant. Uh, and and be, by becoming a participant, and, and again, to really mix the metaphors, the virality of it all changes, uh, changes the outcome quite dramatically as we can see everywhere from what happened during the Arab Spring uh, all the way to, uh, to now, very recently now, you have these little uh, uh, sort of uh, warnings on fake news uh, that are going out at least on Twitter and not quite yet on Facebook. Um, so so uh, very much an evolving topic in which extreme scholarship now, the only thing I will conclude with is to say, unfortunately, innovation and technology cannot and will not be stopped. So what we will need to do is to evolve the practices around how we use them um, uh, rather than try to stop the technology and the innovations themselves. Uh, just, I just add quickly that um, Ms. Scannon had a conference about a year and a half ago uh, at which we brought in Martin Guri. Uh, he's the author of a book called uh, The Revolt of the Public. And he uh, essentially hypothesizes that the spread of social media has undermined authority of all kinds, not just governmental authority, but the authority of experts, um, the authority of institutions like the main big three uh, uh, news um, channels that we have here to set the terms of the debate. Um, and it's true that, you know, this most recent uh, turning of the, of the civil rights movement was set in motion by people holding up phones to capture uh, police actions against George Floyd. So I think there's no question but that social media has had an enormous impact on 
how politics is conducted, even just how interactions happen between individual citizens and experts, and that's going to have very wide-ranging repercussions. So Kodiak, just one, one, one last addendum to that. I mean, when we, when we first launched into it, I don't know, six, seven years ago in social media terms, we, we were all actually celebrating the democracy of information because the transparency of information and the, the ubiquity, if you will, of it all. But now it's, it's certainly a double-edged sword. And, and while all of that is true and, 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 and Wikipedia and its cousins uh, uh, lend information, knowledge, sometimes misinformation, uh, even more, uh, even, even some other times disinformation. Uh, so we have this entire package that is coming from both the internet broadly, but specifically also from, from social media. And I think over the next 10, 10 years or so, there will be a lot of study on, on the influence of social media on, uh, on democracy. And I, I mean it with a small d. I don't quite mean literal interference in elections as much I, as I mean that it, it, it changes the nature of, of the debate in a democracy. And, and that will be studied. And I think we'll learn more as we go along. Right now, it's a force for great good, and it's a force for great evil simultaneously. Well, certainly information has been weaponized uh, in different points in history, but now with social media, the way that it's being weaponized and the, and the speed to which it can be weaponized is, is pretty profound. All right, uh, we have four more questions to get through, so I'll try to keep us on track. The next question is on tolerance and governments. Are we making a mistake by imagining the state or the state of the state not to be a product of or a response to prevalent social structure. So a liberal view may be removed from the popular view. I'm glad I don't have to answer that. Well, you know, I think, I think the essence of populism is to say that uh, we, the people, have the appropriate view um, and that we only we can speak for ourselves um, and that anyone else is, is pretending or indeed trying to foist some kind of foreign viewpoint upon us. Um, However, those of us who reject populism don't feel that that's the case at all. Um, and we don't talk in terms of a general will or, or things of that sort. I think it's the responsibility of people in authority to be in touch, certainly, with um, the, the population, but also to make the kind of decisions that are uh, in the interest of the whole of society and can move society forward. Narayan? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 have to, I have to agree. I mean, pretty much every democracy in the world is now governed by a majority that represents somewhere between 30 and 40% of the population. So to claim great electoral legitimacy with that on either side, either the side that's actually governing or the side that's not governed, uh, would be an overstatement of, uh, of that legitimacy. So uh, that is why I think uh, the founding fathers in the United States and the, and the construct of the, the legislatures in India uh, roughly head at the same thing, which is if reductio absurdum, you put the Brexit to vote, then the debate will be influenced by social media and it will be influenced by simplistic arguments and emotion on either side. I'm not arguing whether the result is right or wrong. It's simply that the persuasions were uh, uh, simplistic, bordering on the absurd, and, and resulted in, a, uh, in, in the decision that it did. Now, whether that's right or wrong is difficult to tell. The nation was divided almost exactly in half with a small uh, majority in favor uh, in, in, in Britain. So, I, I, I don't agree. I, I actually believe that the logic of uh, legislative democracy, which has uh, representatives uh, arbitrating on behalf of, uh, of the union or the federation, as it were, is a good construct that allows for nuanced uh, debate uh, and, and, and can bring conclusions to complex topics. And topics are only getting more complex than they were when America was founded more than 250 years ago or when India was founded 75 years ago. I, I can't resist uh, slipping in Edmund Burke's uh, ah. 
uh, letter to the. How the, could we get through uh, without Burke showing up? <laughs> yeah, you have to, you have to. You know, your representative owes <laughs> you not his industry only, but his judgment, and he betrays instead of serving you if he sacrifices it to your opinion. However, it's also worth pointing out that uh, Burke then lost the next election after he said that. All right, next question. Do you think a laissez-faire economy is feasible in today's world? And I take that to mean uh, not just in the US, but globally and, and in India and perhaps other places as well. Narayan, you want to take that? You're the financial man. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, you know, I think the, the, I mean, if you literally mean laissez-faire, the, the quick answer, it never was possible. And I, I don't think it's possible now. So uh, if we were stinky, sticking to the literality of it, I don't think it's possible. But that said, has prosperity come from free markets? Has it come from belief in, in, in market ideology broadly? Has it come from putting in institution of so societal and market failure insurance against those odd instances of market failure? I think absolutely yes. So, if I were to slightly uh, tone down the rhetoric to uh, are free mar markets possible, I think not only are they possible, I think they are the least imperfect way of organizing oneself going forward, at least as far as we know today. Of course, knowledge might improve and we might get something else uh, at a future time. But as of now, I have to argue that with some supporting mechanisms, and we can get into those if you like, but with some supporting me mechanisms, free markets, uh, and a market mentality is the right answer to most questions uh, in the economy. I'd just quickly add that um, a lot of the Niskanen Center uh, personnel do come out of a libertarian background um, and retain a faith in the power of markets to um, bring prosperity to all of the people. But um, I'd refer you to Brink Lindsay's rather brilliant trilogy of essays on why the pandemic especially has revealed the limits of libertarianism. Uh, very worth everyone's time. Yeah, I might argue with the libertarian aspect of it a little bit because libertarian maybe allows for uh, freedom that goes even beyond the need to regulate. So I, I would rather that the regulator actually says tennis is played in a rectangular field with a net that's this high and balls that are just changed this often uh, rather than say tennis can be played anywhere in any manner whatsoever and you can peg whatever you call as tennis. So uh, in that sense, I would go for the less libertarian view and the more sort of framework view of, uh, of regulation. Ryan, that is a, a brilliant analogy. Uh, and I, as a tennis player, I appreciate that very much. Uh, Jeff, you mentioned Brink's essays. Where, where could our audience find those? Um, the Niskanen Center's uh, website is the place to find them. So it's niskanencenter.org. Right. Wonderful. All right, our next question. Is there a relationship between Hindu nationalism in India and Christian nationalism in the U.S.? This is a great question. Ryan, again, I defer to you on the first part. Uh, yes, I mean, like everything between our countries, there's many similarities and many differences. Uh, at, at, at one level, uh, the moment you say that the definition of the ideology comes from a religious point of view, then that's an automatic similarity uh, between the two. Uh, India has not been blessed, uh, unlike the US, with a center-right party uh, for very long. It had one which died an untimely death when the word socialist was inserted with, uh, in a, in a, with an amendment in the constitution um, in, the, in, the, in the 70s in India. Uh, but we have not had a long history of a right of center uh, moderate party. Uh, but we have always had, uh, if not a political uh, party, but uh, an ideological persuasion that is rooted uh, in the majority religion, which is, which is Hindu. And in that sense is very similar to uh, the US. In the US, if I, if I am correct, and Jeff, I, I will stand corrected if I'm not, uh, the, the moderate wing of the Republican party actually predates the, uh, the, the religious one by quite a bit. And the religious one is a much more modern construct. It's actually the opposite uh, in India. 
also the issues of uh, the two parties uh, are while while majoritarian and I don't even know whether the word majoritarian applies in the US anymore but the word majoritarian is certainly applicable in India while while majoritarian in India the the issues are different uh, so for instance uh, the protection of the cow is, is, is a uniquely cultural aspect of the Indian uh, uh, religious right rather than of anywhere else and and so on abortion uh, ancient societies like India and China is one place where India and China have a lot of lot in common long ago uh, uh, yielded the right uh, uh, of abortion to to the person who makes the election which is the mother rather than anyone else and so on so uh, this is this is not not in independent democratic India but way before that even uh, and so those are non issues really in 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 the uh, ideology of the Indian right, but but there are many other issues uh, that include, uh, for instance, uh, the, the sacredness of the cow and so on. And there are many such. We can go into those in detail. Jeff, uh, it just happens coincidentally that I'm reading a book right now by Robert P. Jones um, called "White Too Long: The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity," um, which seems pretty germane to the moment um, and the Republican Party's character certainly did change when it moved toward making evangelical Christianity its base, in effect. And Jeff, would you, where would you, what rough moment in U.S. history would you trace that back to? 1980. Uh, that's the first moment that the uh, white American evangelical community backed the Republican Party for the first time. Um, and curiously, they were drawn into politics after a long hiatus since the 1920s um, by Jimmy Carter's candidacy for the Democratic Party, but pretty quickly shifted to the Republicans after 1980. All right, we are down to our final question. I think we have about four minutes left. So how do we make classic liberal ideas more attractive to young people in both countries? Unlike the left and right-wing populace, we do not have a silver bullet solution to offer for any public policy problem. We joke about it here that if you can't fit it on a bumper sticker, people often stop paying attention. Since you mentioned the word bumper sticker, I think uh, before we get to the actual content itself, let's talk about the, 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 the method of the channel. So I think uh, moderates and liberals will have to 30 second video and bumper sticker, whatever they're saying. Uh, and, and, and it's tough because uh, moderates generally prefer the nuance and, and live in the nuance of things. But the, uh, we, we've got to believe and, and, and accept that the, the method of persuasion now is a nanosecond, uh, metaphorically speaking, and therefore the, 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 the method has to uh, embrace uh, that, that uh, completely. That said, uh, I'm very confident that the populace of the left and right will shoot themselves not only in the foot, but in the heart and lung and every other organ that they need to do, uh, which they are doing amply well right now. So it, it, the discrediting of, uh, of completely uh, vacuous uh, political philosophies will be proven to be so uh, in time. So I don't think we need to attack everything. I mean, there are many things to attack, totalitarianism of China, the appointocracy of Putin, and so on. So the, the shades of democracy. Uh, generally speaking, we should permit the, the tent of democracy to be very wide. And generally for large heterogeneous countries, the answer is always in the middle. And so tough as it may sound, if we are able to modify the, the, the method, I think uh, the populace, the millennials will come to us rather than the other way around. Thanks, Narayan. There's, there's a long running joke to the effect that if moderates had tried to put their philosophy on a bumper sticker, it would be something like, what do we want? Uh, incremental change and open dialogue. When do we want it? As soon as is practicable. Um, which obviously doesn't have, you know, the kind of thrill of more extreme philosophies, but I think what moderation has going for it, indeed liberalism that underlies both the center-right and the center-left, um, is that it's the only way to actually make progress. Um, revolutions of all kind inevitably end in um, disaster and blood. Um, and what we're seeing now uh, with the Trump administration is that the kind of populism that he sees not only tears countries apart, but ultimately uh, leads to 
problems because incompetence is inevitably associated with populism. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, maybe as things get worse, uh, people will actually see that the temptations of extremism are actually not the way forward. Um, that in fact, there has to be a lot of hard work done in terms of persuading people who don't agree with you, um, considering their perspective, um, trying to walk a mile in their shoes, as the old expression goes, and then actually uh, doing the hard work in Congress of building coalitions to pass legislation. Um, and you know, this has not changed throughout our history. Uh, it has not changed really in India's democratic experience. It's the only way forward. And I think that's what the moderate path has going forward. Yeah, and I don't think it's a contradiction in terms that, uh, that you, can, you can inspire uh, and yet be you know, classically liberal or moderate. Uh, I, I think it's a fallacy to believe that that's a contradiction in terms. Yeah, there are many, many figures in history, uh, Voltaire for one, who, who, who would definitely fit that definition of being an extraordinary uh, uh, kind of inspiration but at the same time is able to communicate uh, uh, what is uh, effectively uh, freedom, liberty, pluralism, peace, uh, all of the things that we stand for on, on this panel. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for such a thoughtful conversation. I've certainly enjoyed it. I hope that our participants have enjoyed it as well. And now I'm going to turn it over to Pratek from the Takshashila Institution to give our closing remarks. Thanks, Kodiak. Uh, I'll keep this quick because we're at the end of the hour and depending on where you are, you're either looking to finish your day or get on with the rest of your day. Right. So, so, you know, we, we've come to the end of our uh, three part, three part series. And I hope through this, con through this conversation, we were able to emphasize the relevance of liberalism, market dynamism and open societies in India, in US, and of course, the entire uh, post pandemic world. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I do want to thank the Scanlon Center for this collaborative effort. And I want to thank thank all our audience for being a part of this journey with us, uh, so whether it was listening to the conversation or asking uh, brilliant, incisive questions. Uh, it, it was, I think, a great intellectual exercise for all of us. Right? Uh, and I just want to conclude very quickly saying that, you know, freedom, freedom, tolerance and pluralism, these are all part of our DNA. And, you know, we want to continue holding these, upholding these values in both in public policy and in public discourse. And with that, I'll, I'll close. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.